Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. The media landscape in the United States has been changing for a long time, but Donald Trump has taken us to places we have never been when it comes to news coverage, presidential politics, and the relations between important public figures and the press. Now that we have cable television, the internet, social media, and many other forms of almost instant communication, it's not even clear what constitutes the press or what standards should be adhered to. We'll try to sort some of this out with my guest, a journalist, an historian, a distinguished professor of journalism at CUNY's Brooklyn College, and the media critic for The Nation magazine, Eric Alterman. Eric, thanks for coming in, appreciate it. Thank you. So, you recently wrote, this is a quote, never have we faced the kinds of threats to the media's role in protecting and defending our democracy that we face today. Talk a little bit about those threats. Well, I wrote that in part because it's, it's hard to parse all of the various threats that the media face today. They're coming from so many directions at once that um, I, I personally have trouble keeping them all in my head uh, at the same time. Uh, obviously, Donald Trump is a unique threat to the media, in part because he doesn't seem to believe in the First Amendment. He doesn't seem to have any respect for the... Uh, press's role as the um, interlocutor for the public. Right. He is also a genius at manipulating the media. He's, he, his tweets are these big shiny objects that the media chase like a dog and uh, gets them off the topic of more serious things. And he threatens people. He right. scares people, uh, with his, uh, both with his own personal attacks that he levels on, on Twitter but also with the minions who follow him and, and are actually kind of scary and threatening. And uh, journalists have had to call the police and say, I'm, I'm really worried. Uh, but even if Donald Trump were not around, the media would be threatened. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because the serious media, the, the media that try and tell the truth and try to get at the truth and try to hold government accountable, have, have lost their way uh, economically and also to some degree existentially. Right. Um, the, the business model that sustains our serious media institutions has by and large collapsed. Um, people expect their news for free, and yet it's ex very expensive to gather and to pay people who know what they're doing to provide it. And so all of our media institutions, um, particularly the most important ones, which are newspapers, have had to cut back enormously on the stuff that doesn't make money. The stuff that makes money is by and large not serious, right. the stuff that's expensive doesn't make money. Many have gone out of business. Right. Um, but even the best ones, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, even more seriously, and um, others, I, I am hesitant to, call, to put the Wall Street Journal in that category because it's owned by Rupert Murdoch, right. and it's a separate thing. But they're, they're all operating at about 40% lower than they were uh, 10 years ago. So we've lost 40% of our ability to hold government accountable and to keep citizens informed. And that is continuing. In fact, it's metastasizing. In the past six months, I think, were the worst six months for... At a time government. when it is more important, uh, probably than any time in my lifetime, to have a, a vibrant and effective press. Right. Well, we used to have a model. You can see it every once in a while on a local level. We used to have a model where the media would do investigative reporting and they would find out some example of malfeasance, and then the government would be forced to react. Right. Uh, and now, on the one hand, the media are not capable of doing a, an awful lot of that reporting. And number two, there's so much media, and there's so, much, uh, there, there, there's so many different kinds of media, and so much of it is not based in fact, so much of it is ideological or, or entertainment-based, that n very few institutions have that power anymore. So politicians can, and any powerful person, can get away with almost anything these days. You wrote a book 
what liberal media, and I think that was in 2003. It's when I bought my apartment, so that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> I came into the news business in, in the 1970s, and then the, you know, the Watergate era was, yeah. was going on and, and that sort of thing. Try and give us a bit of a contrast between what the media landscape was like, let's say, in the early to mid-70s, um, when we thought things were pretty rough, frankly, and, and what, it, what it's like now. Okay, well, first of all, as I, I'm a professor of journalism, and on the first day of class, I always tell my students that media is a plural noun. Media are, not media is. And actually, that's on page one of what little media, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that's because when you talk about the media, you have to define your terms. You can be talking about the National Enquirer or, or New York Times um, or, or TMZ, and you've got very different things going on. So most people, when they complain about the media or they criticize the media, they mean the elite media. They mean the, the top national newspapers and the networks. What we used to call the press. Yeah. And uh, in those days, uh, the media served a different purpose than they do today. They served the purpose as gatekeepers. They decided what was appropriate to think about and how it was appropriate to think about. They set the parameters of discourse. So, uh, for instance, uh, nobody ever mentioned Franklin Roosevelt's polio. Right. Nobody ever mentioned John Kennedy's sexual affairs. This was all agreed that it was outside the parameters of discussion. And nobody mentioned, uh, with a few exceptions, how that the president was lying about Vietnam. And, right. and, and, and no one ever criticized Israel. And it was for better and worse that there was a certain seriousness, but a very narrow band of, of available information. So the internet democratized information and transform this uh, media uh, so that now information is incredibly widely available, but at the same time, it, it, it adulterated it with a lot of crap. Like, but uh, it, was, it was already changing, though, before the, the internet. I mean, well, talk radio after, changed after, after, When Watergate changed it, I mean, they started reporting on things that they had not talked about before. Watergate changed it, but it changed back again uh, under Reagan. Watergate, there was a brief, there was a moment uh, where all American politics opened up and you had George McGovern uh, running as kind of... I think about the Gary Hart scandal. Uh, yeah, things got reported that, well, Gary Hart asked for it. I mean, he specifically said, follow me around. <laughs> if he hadn't said that, it wouldn't have happened. Right. No, I think the media actually, there was, a, like the, the 1970s was a period of experimentation and openness in all aspects of American culture. But in any event, you're right. The internet comes along. Yeah. And there's all well, different kinds okay, of Okay, you could media. say that talk radio happened and then the internet right. happened. Um, when I published my first book in 1992 about pundits, I missed the whole talk radio thing, which was just starting. But they, talk radio was the first group of people to challenge the primacy of the mainstream media in defining what matters and what you can say about it. They did it from the right. And then the internet came along, and originally the internet or blogosphere was kind of a left-wing phenomenon. And uh, it was great for a while because it, it, it held the mainstream media accountable, and it also brought out stories that the mainstream didn't want to report. When Josh Marshall's uh, Talking Points memo uh, reported that Trent Lott had praised Strom Thurmond's 1948 right. segregationist run, all journalists were in the room at that time. They didn't think it was worth reporting. But when Josh Marshall reported it, uh, it lost Trent Lott his job as the Republican minority leader because it was, it was offensive to people. Right. So, um, but uh, eventually what happened is that, like Gresham's Law, bad information chased out good information. And now that uh, the Internet is king, we have two big problems. One is, is that institutions like the New York Times and, uh, and others don't know how to make any money on it compared to what it costs to right. provide the news. And number two, it's impossible to tell what's true and what's not. Because with social media and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all these things look alike. You teach college students. So what do you tell them about navigating the news uh, on the web? How do they make a distinction between what's legitimate news and what's not legitimate news? Well, or what's reliable you know, I, I and, teach, and what's not reliable? I teach a lot of things. Uh, I'm a professor of English as well as journalism. And, and I always focus on the very first day on the quality of source material. And I walk them through different kinds of sources. There's 
my mother's Aunt Rose or something on the bus. I always tell them that story. <laughs> and I begin with that, and then I go through the National Enquirer and, and, and TMZ and the entertainment shows and then newspapers and magazines with fact checkers and then academic journals and so forth. And that's, if I teach them anything, uh, and I'm not sure I do, I try to teach them critical thinking about source material. So uh, that's almost impossible to find on the internet. It's impossible to know what your source is. I mean, it's, you can do it, it's, but it's work. You always have to be a professional. Right. Anyway. So that's one of our biggest problems. Um, and again, it, it makes me kind of nostalgic. My first book, I was, was kind of an attack on the gatekeepers because they were keeping out news that was not comfortable for them. But now I'm pretty nostalgic for them because I, I've seen uh, what the other side looks like. And instead of a vibrant democracy, it looks more like the wall of a bathroom. So if you think about um, what a lot of people consider mainstream media now, and, and then that would include papers like the New York Times, Washington Post, um, uh, I guess uh, CNN, um, MSNBC on, on television, because that's where most people get their television news now, also Fox News, but put Fox News in a separate category, characterized their coverage of the Trump phenomenon going all the way back to the Republican primaries through the campaign, and through the election. I, I think we need to make a distinction that I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. I think newspapers did a pretty good job mm -hmm. covering Trump. They had a big uh, flaw, an important flaw, which is one I wrote a long article about in The Nation um, that I spent a long time on, uh, which I called false equivalents, mm -hmm. um, where they, whenever they would want to say something that sounded critical about Trump, they would have to say something critical about Hillary Clinton. And as a result, uh, the issues like the, um, <clears throat> the email issue were blown way out of proportion right. to the, uh, the Clinton Foundation, which was a pretty good foundation compared to the Trump Foundation. So they, made, they made it sound like the email story was as egregious as all this stuff that was going right. on with Trump. That's their flaw. On the other hand, they provided, if you just read newspapers, you would know everything you needed to know about Donald Trump. Right. And you couldn't possibly think that man was qualified or appropriate to be president of the United States. It's not true of the cable networks or the network or the or the broadcast networks. They the cable networks found out it was that very first debate that everybody watched in the summer of 2015 right. where 22 million people watched on Fox because of Donald Trump. He was right. He said without me they get 2 million, with me they get 20 million. And all the networks saw that this was an enormous boon. Every time they had Trump on, they got great ratings. And that's, that's how they saw things. So I wouldn't even put Fox in a different category. I would say it would be hard to tell the difference between Fox and CNN uh, covering Trump. They both rode him like a bucking bronco to enormous riches. Do you think the... Um, and MSNBC, by the way, is only marginally better. Do you think even the newspapers made it clear how, this will, I guess, be my opinion, but how unqualified Trump is to hold the office of the presidency, how much he does not know about the important issues of our time, and how egregious his character is, that it's remote, I think, from any, th any president, certainly in, in my lifetime. I think they made a mistake you know, in this election, almost no newspaper endorsed Donald Trump. And I think they thought that because they were saying these things in their editorial pages, they should stick to the appearance of objectivity and balance in their news pages. And so, no, they, they, they didn't do that. To be fair, it's impossible to do that. Donald Trump is so different. He's so strange. He's so unqualified in so many ways. On the one hand, he knows nothing and cares nothing about policy. On the other hand, he's a sexist pig. On the other hand, he exploits racism. On the other hand, he doesn't care that he's caught lying all the time. When, when he was on, when he was in that debate, one of the debates, he was asked, what about you, you tweeting the fact that this woman had a sex tape? And he said, I did not tweet that. <laughs> millions and millions but, of people read that tweet. He just doesn't care. That's a brand new thing. I wrote a, my doctoral dissertation was about presidential lying. And I wrote a history of this. There's never been anything like this. But what's the point of a free press if you can't convey 
that someone is profoundly unqualified to be the president, to hold the highest office um, in the land. There, there, there must be some way, it seems to me like the editors and publishers and everybody and reporters and columnists and everybody else should have been talking seriously about this. There must have been some way to convey this. There should be, because otherwise, um, there, there's no point to have a, a free press. It's like saying, like, well, something the, the most horrible thing has happened, but we can't report on it. There's going to be a war, but we can't report that there's a war. You know, what's happening now in the press is that more and more, particularly at the cable stations, but also on the op-ed pages, they're looking for people who will support Trump. They're looking for people who will be Trump's voice because they're saying he represents millions and millions of people, and we all didn't catch this. We were out to lunch. And it's our job to represent the views of Americans rather than to report the truth. Who? The truth has become a kind of elite commodity, which is only interesting to some people. But what's much more interest, what's much more important to these profit-making institutions, it's important. They need to make a profit. They have a answerable to their stockholders, uh, is the fact that they are getting, that they are satisfying their customers. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, they are, for, for decades, Conservatives have been attacking the press for being too liberal. That's what inspired my yep. book, What Liberal Media. And I, I call it, well, I borrowed the phrase from a Republican uh, chairman named Rich Bond, who said, what we're doing is working the refs. And if you, if you work the refs in a, in a sports match, the refs going to throw you a few calls just to shut you up at best. He might listen to you and decide that you're right. But even if you're not right, he's going to want to... Well, Get now we've gone back. to the extreme. It's not just right. well, throwing they, you a few calls. Well, they've been beating up the refs for so long, and the press has been giving in every time. And the more they, more they give in, the more they do it. It's, a, it's like a magical formula. And it seems to me that the more the press gives in, um, the less worth the press, press has. We, I mean, it leads me to this question. I mean, it's generally believed, I, I think, or maybe the public doesn't believe this now, but a free and vibrant press is, is crucial uh, to a thriving democracy. The, the, the press has a crucial role to play. Yeah, um, that's why it's the First it, Amendment. Ex exactly. Yeah. So if you were explaining this to your students, if someone said to you, well, why is the press so important? How is the press different from any other business, especially, especially since you just said it's a business and, and they have to make a profit? Why is the press any more important to democracy than, than any other corporation? W what would you say? Um, the press plays two crucial and in some ways contradictory roles in democracy. I often write about this argument. I won't go into it in detail, but... Walter Lippmann and the philosopher John Dewey had a really fascinating argument about this in the 1920s, and the issues that they raised in that argument are just as relevant today. Lippmann said the point of the press is to give people good information so they can make choices about their leaders. Dewey said the point of the press is to help the public discover its values so it can pick leaders that represent them, because the information is, they both agree that the information itself is too complicated for people to handle. Right. So. Uh, so the press plays two important roles in a democracy, again, imperfectly in both cases. One is to provide individuals with information so they can pick their leaders based on what those leaders say. The other one is to have a conversation for the public as a kind of surrogate so that the public can figure out what it, what it wants from its leaders. Um, but if the information is completely corrupted, then both of those, both of those practices are impossible. So that's what we have now. On the one hand, there's less and less reliable information because these institutions are, are, are economically challenged and cutting people. On the other hand, there's more and more crap in the system. And, and, and you, can, you can attack the press for how bad things are, but you have to see it from their point of view, too. I mean, the, these, the serious institutions, like the New York Times, right. which is that they face these challenges that nobody has an answer for. Hovering over almost everything that we're talking about <laughs> is the specter of Rupert Murdoch, who has yes. had such an incredible um, effect on the press. Now it's for uh, several decades. Um, talk about what he's done to, to uh, the free press in America. You know, I, I don't win a lot of awards, but I did win an award once for media criticism, and it, and it was in part for a, t for a discussion of Fox News where I wrote a column and I said, Fox News is not a news organization. It's something else. And we don't have a word for it. 
But the Republican Party is now a subordinate to Fox News. The Republican Party can't do anything that Fox News disapproves of because they can't handle the, the backlash if Fox News goes after them. It's, it's, a, it's a propaganda machine, but it's more than that. And, and Fox News chooses its own truths. Roger Ailes used to be able to do it. I don't know who's doing it now. And, and those become true in, in the system. It becomes impossible to fight them because they're repeated so many times. And so many people believe it. Right. right. And, and one of the things I'm most critical of is that the rest of the media have accepted Fox and Murdoch's other publications like the New York Post into the fraternity of journalism, when that's not what they're doing. They're doing something very different. And in fact, when I accepted this award, Jeff Scarborough handed it to me. I gave, I said that, what I just said now, something like that, and everybody booed me because it was so impolite. Wow. That's part of the problem, mm -hmm. is that it's not polite to call these people for what they are. The other problem is that it makes a lot of money. Fox News makes about a billion dollars. It makes, I think it's responsible for now probably 40% of that entire corporation's profits. And nobody else knows how to make money. So, so everyone's imitating Fox News. And guess what? This problem is getting a lot worse because Trump is such a big money maker for these organizations. If you look at the uh, advertising campaign now that MSNBC is running, it's a full page picture of Donald Trump. And they're supposed to be the liberals. Uh, so Fox has polluted, uh, under Murdoch, has polluted our debate. We would never, no one would ever be talking about whether or not Barack Obama was born in the United States if it hadn't been for right. all the uh, attention that Fox News gave it, even though they don't, don't, don't want to take responsibility for that. Uh, and so many issues like that. I mean, the whole idea that climate change is debatable. If 99.9.7% uh, of, uh, of the climate, climatologists right. in America think it's man-made and real, and it's man-made and real. You and I are not capable of it. Right. But on Fox News, it's not real. And so in, in you have not, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the past four years, you've not had a single Republican running on the actual science of climate right. change. Every right. single one has disputed it. No other country has a major political party that disputes the reality of climate change. Not one. Only the United States, and that's due to the power of Murdoch and Fox News the, and the Koch brothers. We have the Trump presidency, and um, the press is going to have to cover it, and uh, the legitimate actors in the press are going to have to cover it. Um, are you at all optimistic that an even adequate job uh, will be done? I'm not at all optimistic, no. On the one hand, I don't really know how to do it. Like I said, Trump is so new. I've been reading a, a very long biography of the Warburg family by um, Ron Chernow, right. who wrote Hamilton. Just bought that book. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. It's, it's great, but I'm, in, I'm stuck in the part about Nazi Germany. I'm not saying Trump is a Nazi, but what I am saying is that the German Jews in particular could not bring themselves to believe what was happening, right. uh, even though they kept getting hit over the head with it. And, and we're not ready to believe Donald Trump. We have this idea, and we're running out of time, but we have this idea that it can't happen here, here, and, and that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous idea. We don't know what can happen here. Our, our institutions have here. never been challenged the way that Donald Trump is challenging them. Eric Altman, um, thank you so much. We've run out of time. I wish we had more time, and I hope I can persuade you to come back and talk. Oh, I enjoyed more. this. I'd be happy to come back. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. I keep hearing that to a great extent, Donald Trump owes his presidency to the support of the white working class in America. That may be true, but Trump has certainly given the back of his hand to that constituency with his deplorable choice of Andy Puzder to be the U.S. Labor Secretary. Puzder heads the Carl's Jr. and Hardee's fast food chains, and trust me, he is no friend of working men or women, no matter what color they are. For one thing, he is opposed federal and local efforts to raise the minimum wage. When California was campaigning to raise the minimum to $15 an hour by 2022, which is still five years from now, Puzder complained 
how do you pay somebody $15 an hour to scoop ice cream? Based on his public comments, there's not much in the way of any kind of wages that Puzder is happy to pay. He gave Business Insider a blunt explanation of the advantages that come with replacing human workers with machines. Machines, he says, are always polite, they never take a vacation, they never show up late, there's never a slip and fall, or an age, sex, or race discrimination case. As for the workers he's already employing, there's this from the New York Times. Puzder's company has paid millions of dollars to settle class action lawsuits that accused it of cheating workers. Among other things, those lawsuits accused the company of altering time records, which enabled the company to cheat workers out of their wages. The company was also accused of requiring managers to work additional hours, but not paying them for the additional time and forcing employees to work during breaks that they were entitled to. If he's confirmed by the Senate, which he probably will be, Puzda will be responsible for championing and safeguarding the interests of American workers. Trump and his cynical roundtable of fabulously wealthy advisors must have had a good laugh when they settled on that appointment. That's all for now. See you next time.